I believe that in the case of Peru, but everywhere as well, it is very important to know what has happened in the past so that you have a real assessment of the situation. On the top of each of these panels, you might have noticed a small little Tudor roses. And they are actually carved to allow fresh air to be injected um, through the coving of that gallery. We got special access to a rare archive which will help us expand our knowledge and inform people here of what their ancestors went through. Sigue siendo muy complicado hablar del conflicto religioso en Zacatecas, tanto por el Estado como por la Iglesia. Creo que a casi 100 años del inicio. Nam doy satrajan Colin Robinson, la Dr. Alison Walters, Jack Mahavti Lai Kent. The idea behind this project is that we're going to produce recombinant proteins that are used as animal vaccines. Good afternoon and welcome to the fourth instalment in our Next Generation Impact series, where we've been talking about all aspects of the impact agenda. Today's event is Maximising Impact, Impact Through Innovation. We'll be finding out more about how innovation is defined within different disciplines and the way impact and innovation feed off of each other. And we've got just the panel to tackle these questions and more. Joining me on the line are the University of Kent's Professor David Wilkinson, whose work focuses on understanding how disorders of the human balance system disrupt brain function. Professor John Williamson as well, who works in the area of philosophy of science and medicine. And Dr. Lena Simeonova, lecturer in operations management at the Kent Business School. And if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, you can also join in on the discussion by sending us any questions or comments in the live chat sidebars on whichever stream you are watching on, and we'll then put those to our panellists. You can also tweet your questions and comment using the hashtag NextGenerationImpact. All right, so to start off, uh, David, I'll go to you first, just broadly. How would you describe research in innovation and their relationship? Um, thank you. Yeah, well, certainly within my um, sphere, there is a clear um, distinction. Um, so with the work that I do, which is around developing um, um, new assessments um, of brain function and um, new interventions, new therapies, the research component is very much um, working up um, in the laboratory, um, uh, proof of concept data, um, trying to gather mechanistic data, which might give some sense as to um, um, how one can later go on to develop a diagnostic tool or an, or an interventional tool. But it is laboratory based. It's usually um, work conducted um, within my academic group. Um, doesn't really involve um, a great deal of clinical input. Um, doesn't involve any regulatory expertise, any industrial expertise. Um, it's that step over, I guess, which really does um, that step over into innovation and impact where um, you really do start to think about how you're going to translate uh, what you've done in the laboratory, um, how you're going to um, take something which is a proof of concept, whether it's um, um, diagnosing a particular condition or, as I say, treating it and begin to get the clinical traction and the regulatory approval um, to apply it within the, quote, real world. So it's quite prescriptive in my area, area really. Um, um, how one dis dis distinguishes between these two processes. And of course, they're um, cyclical, aren't they? And so although one starts with research and moves to innovation, um, you know, as you begin to test your um, idea within the real world, it soon tells you that your theoretical understanding was misplaced and that actually um, you need to go back to the drawing board to understand and explain um, the, um, the patterns that you see in the real world. So yeah, it's an interesting relationship. Yes, and um, David, you might have touched on a bit there, but how do you define innovation and impact within your discipline, um, whether it be evident within a particular community, the wider population, or within policy and procedure? What do you think, David? Well, it's a very broad sphere, but, <clears throat> but for me, it would be um, um, delivering a, um, um, a new clinical therapy which was um, um, adopted within uh, routine practice so it might be in my case a um, new form of brain stimulation um, or in colleagues practice it might be developing a new form of physiotherapy or or drug or it might be um, uh, delivering a new um, psychological assessment which likewise had um, um, nice approval or at least regulatory approval so it really is around um, um, your ideas finding their way into 
the clinical um, workplace um, and, and being routinely adopted, which of course means that um, healthcare commissioners need to be prepared to pay for it, which is the um, $64 million um, question with anything that one develops in the research. Although uh, uh, although you, you may believe that it works, um, unless patients are prepared to use it, doctors are prepared to prescribe it, and um, healthcare commissioners are prepared to pay for it, um, it's a bit of a waste of time. So, yeah. Okay, and what about you, Lena? How would you define innovation and impact within your discipline? Uh, thank you. Yes, so uh, I agree that the definition, because, you know, like all academics, we start from the definition. The definition of innovation is quite broad, and I think everyone understands it in a different way. So some people may see it as something revolutionary. So, for example, introducing drones to uh, vehicle routing systems. So assisting with delivery vans um, to do their optimal scheduling. So this is something quite revolutionary, and it does involve a significant change and shift in technology. But I also feel that there is a more subtle side to innovation, which is, you know, nowadays we have so much data available to us and so much knowledge and really understanding what a business needs. So the ability to identify a true business need, whether it is for a large organization or a small and medium sized organizations, and just to sift through all these data that they have and create something new, which creates impact for the business. Um, this is also innovation in my field, which is a lot to do with improving operations, continuous improvement and optimization of logistics um, and also smart manufacturing. So I would say, yes, it could be quite revolutionary and technology driven, but at the same time, it can also be something existing, which is tailored in a very specific way that targets a true business need um, out there. And John, what do you think uh, in your discipline as well? Yeah, well, I would agree really with uh, David and Lena. Um, there's a kind of distinction in philosophy between research, which tends to focus on our understanding of basic concepts and basic entities, and innovation, which is um, exploiting new ideas in order to suggest improvements in practice, and then impact, which might be understood as um, actually leading to change in practice um, by implementing some of these these innovations in, in practice. So, for example, one of the areas I'm interested in is causality. And a lot of my research is on the nature of causality and um, how we establish causal claims, um, how we assess causal claims, that kind of thing. Um, innovations that might arise out of this concern um, how we can improve our practice in establishing and assessing causal claims. And then impact uh, would be actually making changes in how we assess and establish. So that's at least how I think of it. Yeah, and it's fascinating to hear about your disciplines as well. I mean, we've spoken about research and innovation, but uh, John, what about between innovation and impact more broadly speaking? What's the relationship there? Well, I think actually going out and securing the change is um, essential to securing impact. Um, so uh, a lot of people's innovations are actually exploited by other people and other people uh, secure impact for new ideas and innovative uh, research. Um, so I think from the point of view of the academic, what's interesting about the impact agenda is this idea of exploiting your own research, developing your own innovations, and then exploiting those in innovations and putting them into practice. So it's kind of furthering the the, the links in the chain that the researcher is involved in. And that's particularly interesting for philosophy, where we tend to focus primarily at the, at the first bit, the research, trying to improve our understanding of the world, basic concepts like right and wrong, knowledge, uh, the nature of events and things like that. We don't tend to be concerned in philosophy too much with impact. And so the impact agenda has been interesting in kind of pushing our focus more in, in that direction. 
Yes, and, and Lena. So what innovation did your work achieve that you would say you're most proud of? What impact did this innovation have? And there are more than one things that I am very proud of. Um, I have worked on large projects which have international impact. For example, um, I worked on a project with the National Crime Agency and Kent Police, where I was a lead analyst. And the tools that we developed have been disseminated internationally, and they were aiming to um, recognize the most, um, the most serious offenders online which were targeting vulnerable children so it was it was very it was work that was very dear to my heart um, and this project had a very very wide impact and i am very proud of what we achieved but at the same time i also work with small and medium-sized businesses so for example currently i'm working on a project with a company which only has two employees um, but the impact that we can achieve together it's really significant and when the business comes back to us and says what we did here is really going to make a difference for us. And when I hear this sentence, this is when I know that our work and our research and innovation translates into impact. So it's not so much about size. Um, of course, we, we all want to get involved in large projects, but the small ones with local companies and in the, within our local economy are also equally as important and rewarding for us. And just one note following um, from what our panelists said, impact goes both ways um, because sometimes we as researchers can be a little bit isolated in our research. For example, a lot of the data that we work with as, um, as researchers is standardized benchmarks. So it is just the standard sets that we find online. But once we get the opportunity and the chance to work with real data, it's not just that our research has impact on organizations which have provided us that data, but also for us to know that we can really and truly bridge the gap between academia and practice, which is something that we are quite interested in the business school. Yeah, and it's amazing to hear uh, the difference that you're making. Uh, and John, what about you? What are you most proud of and the impact that it had? Well, as I mentioned um, before, I've been interested in causality and establishing causal relationships. And I've been working with quite a few collaborators um, from both academia and beyond on trying to understand how to improve our methods for uh, assessing causal relationships. So, for example, I've worked with the International Agency for Research on Cancer and that agency looks at various chemicals to help classify them as carcinogenic or non-carcinogenic. And then th those classifications are used by governments and um, European Union, for example, in order to restrict um, access to carcinogenic chemicals and reduce incident rates of cancer. And so I've been looking at how they've been classifying uh, chemicals as carcinogenic or non-carcinogenic and that has fed into some of my own research on how one can improve methods in evidence-based medicine in general for assessing causal relationships in medicine and um, I've been kind of translating that to working with NICE and suggesting improvements to their own methods for um, assessing uh, uh, interventions in the health services of England and Wales, for example. So it's trying to identify best practice, um, applying that, sort of generalizing it, applying it elsewhere. But that also led back to further improvements in the way in which the International Agency for Research on Cancer um, assesses causality. So recently they've changed their methods and this was partly guided by work that uh, my collaborators and I have been doing on trying to assess evidence and mechanisms when you establish causal claims in medicine and the health sciences. So now the International Agency for Research on Cancer treat evidence and mechanisms much more systematically and coherently. And I think that's a that's a great improvement, and um, it shows how there can be fruitful interplay between philosophy and practice in in medicine and beyond. 
Yes, and that impact on policy and procedure is, is so, so crucial. Uh, David, David, what about yourself? What are you most proud of that you've done and what impact has that had? Um, so I think our most recent achievement is um, to have completed a um, clinical trial, which um, looked to demonstrate the effectiveness of a um, kind of brain stimulation that, um, technique that my group has developed um, in Parkinson's disease. And some of your um, viewers might know that Parkinson's is um, um, you know, a neurological disease um, of um, increasing prevalence and is in fact the fastest growing neurological disease um, currently. Um, it's becoming a very significant um, um, public health concern and not just in, in the elderly. Um, so we developed this um, neurostimulation technique and um, conducted a clinical trial um, which generated some extremely favourable outcomes. And the impact is really felt, in, I guess, in three ways. Most importantly, um, in terms of um, patient benefit, um, and the, uh, we have many testimonials. Um, quite aside from the clinical evidence, we have patients telling us that uh, not only their movement, but their sleep and their memory and um, you know their cognition um, and their depression and anxiety improved very significantly and continued to remain in that improved state for a number of months after they completed the trial. So for, for us, that is a very compelling impact and not impact which um, you know, one can, can measure within a laboratory. And kind of spinning off that um, are two other forms of impact. The first is that the um, US um, Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, um, 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 permitted us to submit an application for clinical approval so that the technique could um, could be adopted clinically. So there was clear impact on um, the regulatory process and we were given breakthrough um, status um, for the therapy um, a year or two ago based on the results of the trial. And the other impact really is around the way in which it's developed the relationship with our um, corporate industrial partner who um, produces the stimulation device and is, and is of course needed to manufacture the device and distribute it and has the um, downstream expertise that, that as an academic, my group, you know, as academics, my group really doesn't have. Um, so the more success you find at the kind of bedside, um, the more success you find with your collaborations and with the favorable response at the regulatory um, level to push everything forward at that faster rate. And so, um, very excited and everything has actually come together now in that a charity, a national charity, a Parkinson's charity, um, wants to partner with us to open the first ever um, centre for Parkinson's treatment based on non-invasive um, therapies as opposed to drug therapies. That's a, an unexpected outcome and will lead to massive impact um, if we can raise the money needed to, um, to proceed with this centre. Um, we, we hope to see a couple of thousand people with Parkinson's a year um, so unintended impact, but very uh, welcome impact that comes from um, developing a, um, you know, a new neurorehabilitation therapy out of the university. Well, you're all obviously helping a lot of people and it's really fascinating to hear all of that. And we've actually had a comment from Will Lovegrove. So he said that research leads to impact via knowledge exchange. Collectively, that process is termed innovation, which is different to the dictionary definition of innovation. So thank you for that comment. Unless anyone has anything to say to that comment at all. Do you agree? No. That's fine. Thank you, Will, for that comment. It was great. So uh, moving on. So uh, research, of course, can span decades. David, you've been researching brain function for a very long time. Um, do you constantly have to keep up with ways to innovate to make consistent change? How do you do it? It's a good question. Um, as I said earlier, the, the development pathway for new brain treatments really is quite formulaic. Um, and once you get onto that pathway, you have to stick with it. You, you, know, you have to run an initial clinical trial to show effectiveness within a kind of idealized environment, a perfect environment. And then you have to kind of roll it out to busy, dirty NHS wards where other people implement the treatment for you. Um, so it's, it's implemented far less um, efficiently. Um, all the time you're applying for additional levels of regulatory expertise, you're talking to healthcare 
commissioners and then once the treatment is adopted and within routine use um, you're conducting mechanistic studies to further understand um, and optimize um, the treatment um, of course to do that work you always have to keep a foot um, within you know the contemporary research literature to try to um, as I say, um, make sure that what you're providing is is absolutely optimised um, and that your dosing is right, that your, um, your, your, your patients that you target are, are, are the best responders, um, that um, there's not some cheaper way of manufacturing. Um, yeah, all of this stuff just kind of happens automatically. Um, and if you stop doing it, then um, you know, you'll fall behind and um, competitor devices and competitor approaches will probably um, supersede yours. So, um, yeah, very much so. And Lena, how do you think innovation leads to impact and vice versa? Is it something researchers really need to think about when starting out with their research? Um, yes, um, of course, we as, as researchers and academics, um, we also have to make an impact and we also have to get involved with the wider community and um, have a more broad um, kind of presence in, in the community as well. Um, and also for all of us, it's very interesting to take part in, in real projects um, in addition to our academic research, which is a little bit more isolated sometimes. Um, and since I'm part of the business school, um, this is quite an important thing for us to do. And also it's related to career progression as well. Uh, but the reason why we really do it is because we want to translate what we know and what we can do within um, within the broader business environment. Um, one thing which we're trying to do now more than before is what we call sustainable innovation. So once we, for example, we start a project uh, with an organization or with a consortium, typically what happened before or what used to happen is we have project deliverables, they're measurable, achievable, and so on, and we get there somehow with knowledge transfer, but sometimes the sustainability aspect was neglected. So what we're trying to improve on now is to incorporate the sustainability in innovation so that the benefits of these projects and the benefits of the impact can also be sustained in the future by the organization. Um, so to appoint champions in the organization who would be responsible for this, um, there are quite a few um, methods or approaches that we can adopt to ensure that what we've achieved with this innovation or with this project um, can be sustainable and the benefits will be realized because sometimes impact can be can be perceived differently by an academic and a practitioner. Um, and this is a story that I really, I really like to tell and I learned a lot from it. Sometimes as academics, we strive for accuracy rates, uh, which are close to 90, 90%. But for practitioners, sometimes a very small margin of improvement means a lot. And I learned this on my project with the National Crime Agency when we were designing these very new and hybridized algorithms to improve the performance of the detection, um, detection tool. And we reported an improvement which, from an academic perspective, was fairly poor. But as soon as we reported it to the heads of the National Crime Agency, their response was, this is an amazing achievement. To us, this means three more children safeguarded. Um, so impact means different things to people. And when we combine and when we work together with academia and with industry, I think every stakeholder has a lot to learn. Yes, and uh, we've had a comment as well. So Stephen Gow said, the UK used to have many leading companies in electronic engineering and telecommunication technologies in good old days. Uh, unfortunately, there are a few alive now. Uh, there are very few alive nowadays. It is challenging to achieve high impact without industries. Have you got any advice on how academics in engineering subjects uh, in such a situation can maximise impact? Does anyone feel like they can answer that? Engineering Lina, background, I uh, but I, oh yes, thank you. Um, 
I don't think any of the three of us come from an engineering background, but I think um, getting out there and uh, making connections with the community and with organizations and trying to brainstorm ideas is one way to go. Uh, because sometimes for academics might be difficult to get access to the right consortium and to the right um, large organizations to have a conversation with. So what we try to do in the business school is to never stop that conversation from flowing. So we always try and find partners. We always brainstorm ideas. I have about four or five meetings which are brainstorming just this week. Not all of them are going to lead to impact or a project, uh, but some of them might. Um, and then obviously outlining a very good funding opportunity um, can also be uh, one way to go. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you. Yeah, I understand yeah. you're not in engineering anyone, but no, that was great, Lena. Thank you very much. Um, and Andy Stiles has almo uh, also commented. Um, so, um, oh, David, did you want to speak to that? Oh, sorry, yeah. go for it. <laughs> so the, um, the brain stimulation device that we use is uh, an electronic device. Um, so um, we work with a, um, a, a medical device company in the US and um, you have to find these corporate partners if if you're you know if you're developing some kind of electrical or electronic innovation that you think um, has a chance of finding its way to market, then uh, you have no alternative. Uh, and I was confronted with this, you know, I guess ten years ago. I was using some basically homemade kit in the back of my garage to um, um, generate the electrical impulses that were needed to um, um, put together my brain stimulation technique. Yeah, I shudder to think now, um, reflecting on it. Um, and it, you know, it occurred to me that there might be something in what I was doing. It might really make a difference to patients' lives. And at that point, my mind fast forwarded to where I needed to be in a decade, a decade or so's time, which was with a reliable um, um, industrial partner and with a reliable clinical partner. Um, I don't know if the clinical partner is so necessary in this example, but. If you can't get to market, if you can't um, implement the innovation without a corporate partner, then my bias is either, you know, think about taking a different line or or, or just start approaching partners, which is what I did. Um, I got onto a patent site, found a US company that was doing something broadly similar to what I was already doing and wrote to them, uh, flew out to meet them for the weekend at quite short notice um, and haven't looked back since. Um, so. You really do need to um, um, just not be um, demotivated if you don't succeed initially. You you have to find um, you know um, a company with that expertise um, um, needed. Thank you, David. John, did you want to say anything about that at all? Yeah, just that I don't think the UK's bad at innovation in general. I think there there are lots of innovative ideas and technology and uh, it's just that these small companies tend to get bought out quite early by larger investors from elsewhere so i think one area where the uk could improve perhaps is in growth from small to large businesses exploiting these new technologies Thank you. Um, no, that was great. And we have had another comment. So, Andy, um, we are going to get to that. So, um, Andy Stiles um, from Vertigo Ventures. So, um, each of you have clearly delivered impact in your respective fields. So, how are you currently communicating this to relevant audiences? And, um, David, did you want to say something on that? Yeah. Um, so, there are several important outlets for me the first is to patient advocacy groups and patient forums um, which actually is best done through um, relevant medical charities um, and as I mentioned earlier that has actually led to a charity wanting to partner with us to um, further develop what we're doing um, so that's most important for me um, of course the work is disseminated through peer-reviewed academic journal um, so a few publications are followed from this um, and then, you know, you, we need to be informing the regulator of, um, of what we're doing as well to um, keep, them up, keep them on side and keep them in a state of mind where when we ask for final 
approval for routine use that you know it's not coming out the dark and that they um you know they're, they're fully briefed and it's just a short step for them to to give that so those are really our three main groups you know the patients the research literature um and um the authorities that allow us to go ahead and apply what we do within a clinical environment and lena what do you think um yes i think these are the conventional way so a lot of times um, innovation and impact also leads to academic output. Uh, but we also try to organize events where we can disseminate um, our work. So at the business school, for example, we hold um, business sound bites and different events where uh, businesses from Kent and Medway um, and even London and just the whole country really sometimes are invited um, and we can brainstorm and talk about all the different things and ways we can collaborate um, through all the pathways and projects we have available at the business school. Uh, one of them is um, a knowledge transfer partnership. And I think probably one thing we can do better is utilize social media uh, because it's, um, it's just become so popular now. And I think some of us are still not wary but um we don't utilize it as much as um as much as we should yes and social media is extremely powerful um and uh, john what do you think how do you communicate yeah well i guess the area i'm particularly interested in is methodological innovation so that's working out how to change the way we, um, we do things outside philosophy and so my main way of communicating is talking to people in interdisciplinary events, finding out how they how their practice works and what scope there is for um, improving practice in that field and what um, best practice they can offer to other disciplines as well. So I, I'm very much in favour of interdisciplinary meetings as a way to exchange ideas and to communicate innovation uh, beyond beyond your own discipline yes and um thank you again everyone for your comments do keep them coming in uh, jenny has a question jenny reynolds so can the panel discuss the most successful funding sources they have tapped into uh, to support innovation lena I'm, um, I'm an early career researcher, so I haven't been a lead investigator on a large grant, but um, I have been applying for quite a few and I have some small grants uh, which have been successful. Um, so I'm not sure I can um, really say much about the, the big grant applications just yet, uh, because I'm more likely to be a co-investigator. Uh, co um, but for, for the small grants, um, yes, um, I have been successful for a few. Um, and the key for that is to identify a very clear business need, um, to develop a very, um, a very good business case, and also to make sure that the outcome is measurable um, and this impact can be measured and achieved. And John, what would you say to that? In philosophy, our main funder is the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And um, as one of the UK research councils, they tried to uh, promote impact by insisting that researchers, when they put forward an application, um, try to talk about the pathways to impact that they could exploit um, to further their research outside the discipline. And I think that was a really good idea. And there was funds available for impact through that mechanism and that's um, certainly one of my projects made very good use of that and our work with NICE and the International Agency for Research on Cancer getting funding for impact but I gather um, that that uh, research councils are, are devoting less attention now to impact and aren't asking researchers to exploit uh, pathways to impact. So I guess this kind of blows with the wind a bit how the government feels about um, the necessity of impact. But certainly I found that to be very useful in the past. And David, what about you? Yeah, I mean, the, there are a fair number of funders within the um, biomedical research space. Um, my biggest sources, I've had funding from a number of different places. My the biggest goal I've got was from the Medical Research Council uh, for Experimental Medicine. Um, 
I got a fair bit of money off my corporate partner in the US. Um, and I've also received a fair bit um, from philanthropic donations. Um, there are some things about grant success, which I, I wish I knew from the start. And one is that good applications do get funded eventually. Um, convincing pilot data is essential, even if it's not published. Um, your study outcomes need to be informative, regardless of whether your hypotheses are actually met. Um, letters of support from non-academic stakeholders are really helpful to show the wider relevance and sincerity of your work. It's really important to talk to the um, program directors uh, if you're applying for funding. You know, talk to the program officer, talk to the program director, and make sure that what you're going to submit is within remit. Well, you know, spent a lot of time putting together a grant application to the NIHR, and it was dismissed because it wasn't out of remit. Really, I should have spoken to them first. Um, health and social care funders want practical solutions, not academic findings, and they want them quickly. That is probably, for, in my sphere, the most important thing to remember. Um, it's important to highlight the potential weaknesses in your grant application and then say how you're mitigating them rather than to just pretend that they're not there and that reviewers aren't going to dig them out because if they're good reviewers, then they, they will do. Um, your grant application really has to be your very best work because you can't, you can't be perfect at everything that you do as an academic, but your grant applications have to be amongst that very best work. Um, I think the other thing I would say is it doesn't matter which university you belong to, you know, on the grant panel, grant panels that I sit on, it doesn't matter where the applicant is from. What matters is the quality of the team that they have around them. So you, know, you might think, oh, yeah, I'm at Kent, I'm not at Oxford or Harvard or Cambridge. It doesn't matter. All that matters is the credibility of the team. So make sure the team is good and it's multidis multidisciplinary. Um, Perfect. Well, thank you very much for answering those. Thank you, everyone, for commenting your questions in. Amazing questions. We're going to take a quick break from the discussion to hear a testimonial from Tracy Green. She's the head of the Centre for Child Protection at the University of Kent, and she talks about simulation learning and how it's benefited child protection education and kept young people safe. To really deeply learn something new is a challenge. However, Simulation learning is well established in the literature as a means to develop this deeper learning with aviation, military and medical professionals, to name a few, benefiting greatly from the use of simulation learning to develop those critical skills before practice in order to reduce risks. Why not use this in child protection work too? Current contemporary training in child protection tends to use a variety of methods, including paper case studies, research, discussions, and films. However, these approaches can give limited opportunities to actually practice skills, to discuss feelings, and to interact with a case. <clears throat> My name's Tracy Green, and I'm the head of the Center for Child Protection at the University of Kent. I'll be talking about the center's impact case study to demonstrate how simulation learning was innovatively applied to child protection education in order to benefit vulnerable children and young people, as well as the practitioners who work with them. Professor Jane Reeves and Professor David Shemmings created the center back in 2012 as an interprofessional center for excellence. And they pioneered the use of simulation training within child protection resulting in two main simulation strands for the center, the rosy suite and the grooming suite. Both suites were developed alongside various key stakeholder groups, such as CAFCAS, which is the Children and Families Advisory Service, Kent Police, NHS, the Home Office, just to name a few. And they've been developed via primary and secondary research including an assortment of evaluation studies and focus groups with young people. So there's been a lot to go into the development of each one of these simulations. The ROSI suite comprises of three simulations, which are used for continuing professional development for various child protection professionals. ROSI 1, which was our simulation prototype looking at children and family social workers undertaking a challenging home visit around growing concerns of sexual abuse. And Rosie 2, 
which follows the same family five years later and focuses on exploring complexity, neglect, and undertaking an inter interdisciplinary home visit. And there's also my courtroom, Rosie's family goes to court. And this sees the family three years later where they enter private and public family proceedings, providing practitioners with a background to cultivate courtroom skills and knowledge. The grooming suite comprises of three different simulations too, and they target variations of grooming practices and they're designed to be used for continuing professional development for various professionals who work with vulnerable children and young people. However, they're also designed to be used directly with the young people to help them learn to keep themselves safe too. Zach is one of them, and that was developed to tackle online grooming. It was, sorry, I'm gonna re-say that, that's okay. Zach is one of them, and it was developed to tackle online grooming for young people on radicalization. Lottie was created to look at child sexual exploitation, and Behind Closed Doors, which is our most recent edition, looked at extremism and radicalization as well. Now these innovative simulations have contributed to the professional development, knowledge and practice of educational and self-care practitioners across the UK and internationally. For example, since August, 2012, the center has sold over 8,762 licenses for Rosie Two and Rosie My Courtroom and reached a further 6,000 stakeholders through the freely downloadable Rosie One simulation, including dissemination in Australia and Denmark. The use of these simulations in the UK and internationally has been met with consistently positive feedback about the benefits of being able to use a realistic simulation with practitioners. Training delegates highlighted the simulation as really helpful in prompting discussion around practice challenges and what it might be like from a child or a family viewpoint. As mentioned, the grooming suite has been used for continuing professional development as well as being used directly with children and young people themselves with outstanding results. For example, in secondary education, the center has trained over 2,465 professionals on the grooming suite. This, include, this has been since about August, 2013 and there's been 6,370 licenses sold, which enable trainers to then use the simulation with an unlimited number of children, parents, and other professionals during a single year. A 2017 survey that we undertook with 146 educators who were trained using Zach and Lottie revealed that between 60 and 95% of them had increased their own knowledge of grooming. 52 to 95% had increased their own knowledge of radicalization and 27 to 59% had recommended changes to their organization's safeguarding policy since being trained. Of the 98 educators who had also used the simulation with young people, 94% believe that their students' knowledge of internet safety and awareness of grooming had increased. One trainer stated that it has made students think about choices they make it's made them think more closely about possible impacts for their actions. I've just discussed a few examples of the exceptional impact of the center's work. We've continued to embrace innovative education in the child protection world. For example, most recently developing a training tool looking at criminal exploitation of young people called Crossing the Lines. And we're doing further work on an international project looking at the development of tools to reduce child sexual exploitation on, again, an international level. We remain passionate about keeping children and young people safe and think an innovative approach offers a creative means to cultivate this essential area of work. Thank you for that contribution, Dr. Tracy Green there. And anyone at home, do feel free to keep your comments coming in. We would love to hear from you. And let's get back into the discussion. So I'll start off with the timescales. So what timescales do you work with? In other words, how much research goes into innovation and how long does it take for an innovation to reach the wider public? Uh, John, I'll go to you first for this. I know it's very subjective, but uh, John, what do you think? Yeah, well, it does vary a lot from area to area, but certainly in my area in philosophy, it can take a lot of research before uh, a key innovation is, is produced. 
Um, and certainly in, in my case, I started working on the research um, that led to the impact that I had recently in about 2005, 2006, um, and then gradually developed the ideas with collaborators. And then around 2015, um, we had sort of honed the methodological innovation that we wanted to promote. And then we started to work with collaborators outside academia and actually implement these innovative ideas in their own methods that they use for um, establishing causal relationships in, in their own uh, in their own organizations so it took quite a long time uh, things do sometimes take quite a long time in philosophy um, to progress from research to innovation um, but nevertheless we've kind of felt like we didn't want to rush things we wanted to get the ideas right first before engaging with with non-academic partners a long time but a big impact uh, what about you lena um i think it um, it depends on the project sometimes we can have something which we believe it's innovative in terms of research so for example i'm working on a vehicle routing algorithm which is applied to um, bus bus routing systems for children with special needs. Um, so in academia or in, in my area of research, the social aspect of sustainability sometimes gets neglected because the environmental one is the one that usually gets incorporated. Um, so this is quite innovative in terms of research and a gap in the literature. So what I'm trying to do now is find a partner um, so that I can apply this in practice. And I'm trying to work closely with the councils um, and any organization which might be interested in this. On the other hand, um, there can also be uh, projects and consortiums whose purpose is once they start to create something which is um, innovative. And I think these probably take a little longer uh, because they might be um, over two years um, long as well. And David, what about timescales for you? Well, I started this current research really back in 2005. Um, and certainly within my area of device development, um, it shouldn't be terribly long, certainly much quicker than drug development to take something from concept to market. But it has taken a bit longer, in, similar to John really. Um, there's a fair bit of work um, getting to the point where um, we felt there might be clinical utility and really there are two kind of steps on the translational pathway the first is to turn a basic research idea which is what we had um, into an applicable idea or product um, and to do that you need to generate clinical clinical collaborations to access the you know, the relevant expertise and population you need to access seed funds because um, this work is usually expensive. Um, you often need to acquire new academic expertise, in my case, in clinical trial methodology. Um, and then to get from the point of um, generating compelling proof of concept clinical data to the point of clinical application, um, there's this next step, which is around developing a knowledge of regulatory frameworks, finding an industrial collaborator, um, you accepting that you're going to have to share ownership of what you've developed um, and your academic freedom is going to be restricted because of the demands of the um, industrial partner. Um, these things will take a lot of time. By 2015, we had good proof of concept data in the clinic that what we were doing was effective. We got it to that point. And by 2021, we've now done the clinical trial um, we need to do another two, three year trial, which if un, you know, unfolds as expected, um, will allow very swift clinical uptake thereon. So in our case, it's taken much longer than it probably should do because we really started from the drawing board. In other cases where there's good proof of concept, where the idea is already quite well developed and it's the innovation part that needs to um, really be worked upon, you're looking at just maybe five or six years. Um, so it's very... And David, how can you predict the benefits that an innovation may have and, and what do you do to enhance these benefits? It's really hard to, um, to predict it, but 
the first thing to do is is to put your own predictions aside and at least in my case go to the patient groups who are going to benefit at the end of the line and ask them what to them would constitute you know something valuable yeah i might have spent years developing something which can improve um i don't know one aspect of motor function in people with parkinson's which works really well really effectively but actually when you go and talk to most people with parkinson's they say well you know what i just deal with that or i manage it or my drugs can deal with that quite effectively it's this thing over here which um really troubles me and which is managed really poorly um so you know so you kind of have to be led by what other, other people think if i'm quite honest with you and likewise um you know doctors won't um um, want to really work with you if you're just generating alternative solutions um, that have already been um, addressed, if you like, you know, uh, uh, the, the need has already been met. Um, so, yeah, a lot of decision making gets taken out of your hands, to be honest with you, as you kind of move forward. And John, mm -hmm. so uh, to what extent are research and innovation actually designed to address concrete problems? And to what extent does innovation happen by chance? Well, in philosophy, um, not a lot of research is designed to affect uh, concrete problems, to impact on concrete problems. So certainly in my discipline, we have to make a bit of an effort if we want to um, move from research to innovation and innovation to impact. Um, I would say the chance element comes in in choosing the right partners to some extent. In the area that I'm involved in, which is methodological innovation, um, a key uh, requirement of impact is finding the right partner who's, who's willing to improve the, its methods and uh, really so many organizations are under financial pressure and all sorts of other pressures that they have little time to think about how they do the things they do and instead focus most of their time on just doing it to, to the best they can at, at, at the moment. So finding an organization that has a headspace, if you like, to be able to, to think about methodological advances and is willing to work with partners to improve I think that's crucial and that that's where an element of chance comes in certainly in in my experience mm -hmm. and uh, lena so uh, what are the positives of ktps their knowledge transfer partnerships and how can they be navigated and their benefit enhanced uh, thank you for this question. Um, actually, I have been an associate on a KTP. KTP stands for Knowledge Transfer Partnership, and it is um, it is a project which usually involves um, an organization and a higher education institution working together. Um, and then an associate is hired, which was myself a few years ago, and um, they would bridge this gap between industry and academia. The knowledge transfer partnership has impact for all stakeholders involved. So the business benefits because the whole business case is designed to improve the business operations. So in my case, um, the partnership was between the University of Kent and the company in Canterbury, who, um, who are specializing in steel production and distribution. So what we had to do is we had to optimize their supply chain and their routing, their logistics system. Um, the company benefited because of all the solutions and tools we designed for them um, together with the academic team, uh, but also the university benefited because we had the opportunity to provide our master students with real data so they can work on their dissertations. And also we have delivered quite a lot of guest lectures on impact and real life change as well. Um, and um, of course it impacted our uh, our uh, academic output. So we have produced um, papers and also impact case studies. But what is really exciting about the KTP is that the associate themselves are also an equal stakeholder. So whoever gets employed on a KTP would have the opportunity to use um, funding so that they can further their career. So what I did is I used my um, KTP funding and opportunity um, to go and develop my skills 
in the direction that I would like my career to progress. So I attended quite a lot of, um, I, I, I gained a lot of certifications. Um, for example, PRINCE2, the Lean Six Sigma, um, Agile, um, Agile Project Management. And now um, I think this really paid off because I'm the director of the MSc in Project Management at the Business School. So the KTPs really do lead to impact for all stakeholders involved um, and can be uh, can be very, very successful if all the stakeholders are equally committed um, and they are equally excited about the opportunity. And just to round up the discussion, one quick final piece of advice from um, you all to those who's watching. So how should you best use innovation to your advantage to maximise your impact? Uh, Lena, we'll go to you first. At the business school, we are very much uh, problem solving oriented. Uh, so for me, it's really identifying a true business need and being able to target it. It sounds very easy, but it's actually very difficult to achieve. Um, and it really comes um, comes with experience. So working with organizations, helping them and really um, designing something which is going to help them grow is um, incredibly rewarding. David, a very quick piece of advice from you. You have to move out of the academic mindset. Um, you know, really, to do this properly, I think you have to be quite strongly motivated to want to make a difference to people outside of academia. And if you're that way inclined, you'll be talking to people within your particular area of expertise anyway. So in my case, it's talking to doctors, it's talking to people with neurodisability, it's talking to charities, and they will tell you where the unmet needs lie. Um, so get out there and find the people who, you know, outside of academia are doing the kind of things which you think you can impress and talk to these people. And John, one final word from you. Yes, well, I'd agree with David and Lena, actually. It's a, it's a two-way thing, in fact. Um, so it's not just placing your own innovation with a partner. It's finding out what their needs are and using their needs and their requirements to help improve your own ideas um, and uh, so it, it benefits both sides but uh, uh, it really has to be a sort of dynamic interaction between the partners. And well thank you very much to everyone on the panel, to Professor David Wilkinson, Professor John Williamson and Dr Lena Simeonova for a fascinating discussion and of course thanks to everyone at home for tuning in and sending through all of your questions and comments. We'll be back at the same time on Thursday July the 1st with the theme of engaging the public with research. To join us for that head to the University of Kent Research Excellent Teams webpage for further details but for now enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you again for another Next Generation Impact Series event. Goodbye.